start, I want to tell you about something new I'm doing this year when I speak at conferences. I've been trying to make my presentations more accessible to people with disabilities. So for anyone who's blind or visually impaired, I'm going to make sure that I read or describe any content I have on slides that is content sort of things, not just decorative images. And I built this in as part of the presentation, so you might not even notice I'm doing this. And you might be thinking, well, I mean, who can write code if they're blind? And there actually are people who do that. And there's also a lot of people who have low vision, so they might work in front of a screen where it's a big screen and the type is really big and they write code, but they can't see the screen at a conference. So I also want to make sure if there's people like that here that they can understand my talk without being able to see the screen. It also helps people uh, not only who are visually impaired, but anyone who is dyslexic, has trouble reading, uh, someone who doesn't speak English as their first language. If you forgot your glass that is at home, perhaps, you just can't see the screen really well. So this is something that can be a benefit to a lot of people who attend a conference. So for any of you who give conference talks, I'd like to encourage you to think about doing this the next time you give a talk. So the title of my talk, it's Code is Not Neutral, The Ethics of Web Development. Uh, my name's Clarissa Peterson. On Twitter, I'm at Clarissa, C-L-A-R-I-S-S-A. -S -S so what is ethics? The dictionary talks about uh, moral duty and obligations. Uh, but, it, but it varies a little because different cultures and different religions now and through history have had different approaches to ethics. The bottom line is generally not harming other people. God, these balloons are annoying. Um, <laughs> sorry, like, like I have like my good vision range to the screen and it's right where the balloon is. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Um, so in reality, ethics is not, just go away. <laughs> Can I actually do something about this? I'm just gonna, there. All right, things are fine now. So in reality, ethics is not that straightforward. For example, there's some ethical standards that are law, like you're not allowed to murder people, but there's an exception for self-defense. So that may be ethical or not, depending on you know, the situation. There's professional ethical standards in many professions, including technical fields like mechanical or electrical engineering. And that's because they make things like bridges and buildings and spaceships where there's serious consequences if something goes wrong in the process. And we don't think of websites and software the same way, but really the things we make can have a real impact on lives, on safety of people in ways that we couldn't even imagine decades ago. So we have a responsibility as developers toward other humans um, to make things in an ethical manner. And if there aren't rules that apply to our profession, we kind of have to figure that out for ourselves. So auto emissions is a really big problem. Uh, here you see a clogged highway in Minnesota with a ton of haze from all the pollutants in the air. There's strict laws in many countries that auto manufacturers have to pass to put their cars on the road. Um, and the problem with this, though, is the things that they do to remove, reduce emissions in their cars also can have a negative effect on fuel economy or performance, which is bad for their business. In 2015, Volks, uh, EPA found out that Volkswagen had intentionally programmed certain diesel engines to cheat on the emission control test. Uh, they made it so that the cars would activate their emission controls only during the test and not in real-world driving conditions. So they were able to pass the test and meet U.S. standards, but the cars would then emit up to 40 times as much pollutants into the air during real-world driving conditions. How this happened, in 2006, James Liang, who was an engineer for Volkswagen at their plant in Germany, you see here, he was working on new diesel engines for cars in the US. Uh, the engine that he made, or that they made there, was, uh, had a better fuel economy, but was not as good as con at controlling emissions. So when they realized that it wouldn't meet standards, um, Liang, the engineer, decided instead of fixing the engine, they should just change the software so they could cheat on the test. So the engine passed the test in the US, and in fact, it got green car tax subsidies and, and tax exemptions. You see it pictured here is actually the 2009 World Car of the Year. When this discrepancy was discovered by the US government, the Volkswagen claimed that it was some sort of technical glitch, but then they were presented with evidence of what they'd done, and they admitted that they manip manipulated the test. So the CEO resigned a few weeks later, which was not surprising. So before you think that pollution is just a little problem, you know, a little stuff in the air, pollution causes actual deaths. This is a photo of London, and you can barely see the skyline because of so much haze in the air. 
6,000 people a year die in London from long-term exposure to air pollution from nitrogen dioxide, which is what comes from diesel engines. Worldwide, that's 100,000 premature deaths every single year, and that number is only getting larger. So looking just at this Volkswagen thing, uh, the extra emissions just from that one engine and just in the US caused around 59 extra premature deaths. So those were 59 people who died because this engineer wrote software to cheat on the test. Um, Volkswagen paid billions of dollars in fines. Many of their executives faced prison. Uh, one of them just started a seven-year sentence. James Liang, the engineer who wrote the software, was sentenced to 40 months plus a $200,000 fine. So this is a bit different because usually what happens is just the high-level employees that get in trouble. And this was one of the first cases where it was just, he's just an engineer. He wasn't the decision maker. He was just basically doing what he was told by his bosses. And that could be any of us. Uh, here you see a picture of Liang with his lawyer after he pled guilty in a screenshot from TV news. So it's pretty clear what he did was illegal as well as unethical. Situations are not often so clear, though. For example, a lot of software can be harmful if it's used incorrectly, either on purpose or by accident. So one example I want to give is this false alarm missile alert that came out in Hawaii in January. You probably remember hearing about this. It was a Saturday morning, and residents and visitors got an all-caps message on their mobile phones. And it said, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. So people were running around in panic, driving at high speeds to get home. The fire department stopped responding to calls. I saw pictures online of people actually lifting their children into storm drains for protection from this incoming missile. Can you imagine how it feels to hear you and your family would likely die in the next few minutes? That's how 1.5 million people were feeling at that moment. So right after this happened, it was thought that the person had accidentally clicked on the wrong link. Um, so there's a lot of analysis of this interface and how easy it would have been to make that mistake. Turns out he actually was just kind of stupid and thought it was not a drill, so it wasn't an interface issue. But it's still worth thinking about that because you could easily make that mistake with the interface that they had. This is a mock-up of what their interface supposedly looks like. They won't show us the exact interface for security reasons. So what, what you see on the screen is a list of several links in what seems kind of like random order. Uh, two of them read PACOM CDW state only and drill PACOM CDW state only. It seems pretty easy to click the wrong one. There's multiple steps to confirm, including entering a password, but the steps throughout that process are exactly the same whether it's a drill or a real alert. So if you're creating software, you need to think about the worst case scenarios of things that can go wrong with that software and how to prevent them from happening, but also think about what, what should happen if that worst case scenario does happen. In this case, they needed to cancel the alert and tell everyone that it wasn't a real missile. Uh, they wanted to send out another text message, but it took Hawaii Emergency Management Agency 38 minutes to get authorization to send out another message. So that's 38 minutes that all of these people were thinking that they and their families were about to die. So here's where ethics comes in. If you worked on that software, whether you're a designer, a developer, a product manager, anything at all, you knew that the results of someone using the software could have really serious consequences. So you need to take time to think about the worst case scenarios and do everything in your power to make sure that uh, you can prevent them or help people recover from them, you know, or both really. It's not just the designer's job. It needs to be everybody because the stakes are so high with something like this. The more people who are thinking about all the things that can go wrong, the more likely you are to come up with all these possible scenarios. So it may not be part of your job, but you should do it anyway. You are responsible for making the software exist, so you have an ethical responsibility to make sure that that software does not hurt people. There's a lot of worst case scenarios when you think about Internet of Things devices. For example, a connected refrigerator. The worst case scenario, it stops working. This is a tweet from Sean Doyle where he says, so new fridge stopped working because it needed a software update. You guys, I don't think I want this future. Hashtag first world problems. So really, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. I mean, it's not life threatening. But at the same time, if all you come home and all your food is ruined, I mean, that's you know hundreds of dollars worth of food. Not everybody can afford to just replace everything in their refrigerator. Here's another one. This is an Instagram post from someone named Ryan Negri. 
he, it's a photo of a car stopped in a deserted road with mountains in the background. And uh, so he has one of these cars where you use your phone to start the car. The only thing is you must have cell service in order to start the car. So if you stop somewhere without cell service, how do you start the car? Um, and he didn't even stop. You just put it in park for a minute, but he was unable to put it back and drive without his phone to authorize him as a driver. So someone with him had to walk two miles up a mountain to get cell service, call someone to come get them, take the driver home to get the physical key fob for the car and drive back to the car so he could start it. So when you buy one of these cars, they actually tell you you should always carry your key fob as backup. But not everybody does that because, I mean, really, why do you buy a car that doesn't require a key if they tell you to carry a key? I mean, who's going to do that? So the driver knows that really it was his fault, but he, he does think there should be some sort of contingency solution to keep things from like this from happening or you know, to fix it once it does happen. This doesn't only apply to remote areas. What if you're in an underground parking garage? What if there's a disaster like an earthquake where all the cell service goes out and you need to evacuate the city? So if you're working on a physical product that's run by software or connected to the internet, you definitely need to be thinking about all these worst case scenarios. So part of this is that people don't always do what you want or expect. They're not gonna carry their backup key, they're gonna forget all their passwords, they're gonna fail to do manual updates, they're not gonna read the instructions. So plan for all of those things. Don't just expect the best from people because that's not the way that humans work, okay? Ethics is not creating products that leave drivers stranded on mountains. So there's lots of things that can go wrong when, in, uh, when you're looking at algorithms. An algorithm, uh, we hear that a lot when we're talking about software ethics. Uh, it's basically a sequence of instructions telling the computer what to do. So when you think about how algorithms work, they can be biased because the people who make them are biased. But users may not realize this because you know, people out there, they look at computers and they're like, well, computers are machines. They must be totally neutral. But really, computers only do what humans tell them to do. A few years, uh, Carnegie, uh, some researchers from Carnegie Mellon University did this test. They created a series of fake Google profiles for male and female job seekers, and then they visited several different job sites on Google, which made them, uh, they were shown ads relating to their job search. Many of them were shown an ad for a coaching service for $200,000 plus executive jobs. But that ad was shown 1,800 times to male profiles and only 300 times to female profiles. So clearly the companies were targeting this ad to men. How can we keep this from happening? Because women should be able to get $200,000 executive jobs too, right? When you're creating an algorithm, think of the worst case scenarios for how somebody could use it. If you allow targeting by gender, how can people use that in a way that's harmful if not illegal? In 2016, news organization ProPublica published this article you see on the screen. Uh, it's titled, Facebook Let's Advertisers Exclude Users by Race. Uh, so what happened was there were advertisers putting housing ads on Facebook and choosing not to, to only show them basically to white people. In the US, this is a violation of the Fair Housing Act, which has been law for the past 50 years, since 1968. And it is a really, really big deal when somebody breaks this law. So in February 2017, Facebook announced they were implementing an automated system to find and remove ads that discriminate illegally like this. So in November 2017, ProPublica tested again, and you see a screenshot here of this test ad that they tried to run. It said, exclude people who match at least one of the following behaviors, multicultural affinity, African-American US, Asian-American US, Hispanic US, Spanish dominant. So based on Facebook's announcement, this housing ad should have been refused, but it wasn't, it was, it was accepted. So Facebook, when they designed the software, they may have not predicted this use, which is bad enough. Um, they didn't think about worst case scenarios, what could go wrong, uh, but they also um, didn't fix it once they knew that something was going wrong, which is pretty bad. If somebody tells you your software is doing something really bad, you need to fix it. So the more people you have thinking about what could go wrong, the more things you can present, prevent. And if you're, leaving it to the de de sorry, if you're leaving it to the designers, they may not always understand all the technicalities of how things are happening in the background. So it's really up to the developers to be thinking of things from that perspective. 
If you're working on a powerful tool, you have the resp responsibility to keep it from being used for bad. And algorithms aren't perfect, and neither are human moderators. For example, Facebook doesn't know the difference between nudity and art. Uh, nudity is banned on Facebook, but they've wrongly taken down people's photos of Michelangelo's David sculpture, which happens to be a sculpture of a naked man, but it's also one of the most famous works of art in the world. Uh, for anyone who is following along with the descriptions of the slide, this is the top half of the statue only. <laughs> an example of another thing Facebook moderators get wrong. I have a friend who runs an independent media website that's been around since 1995. Two years ago, they had 27,000 Facebook followers until their page was permanently deleted by Facebook. Their trouble started earlier 2016. They were posting memes or articles with left-leaning political content. Um, sometimes they were told that things they posted violated the terms of, service, terms of service or community standards. So at first, when this happened, uh, the admin that posted the meme or the article was asked to edit it. But later, uh, the admin who posted it was suspended for 24 hours, three days, seven days, up to 30 days. But the people running this page didn't believe that they were actually violating the terms of service or community standards. Uh, they thought that Facebook was just not looking at the things they're posting in the context. For example, one thing, uh, they had a meme that was showing historical racist and exclusionary signs, but it was clearly displaying them in an anti-racist context. It was like, here's signs that were around in the 50s, we want to make sure the country isn't like this today, which is clearly saying these are bad things, that you know, racism is bad, not good, right? But that post got them suspended for 30 days. So it seemed like whoever looked at it didn't really look at it enough to understand the context and see it's actually anti-racism. Uh, the thing is, other, po other pages and people had posted the exact same meme without any issues at all. It was only this group that was getting in trouble for it. So what happens when you're an admin of a page and you get suspended, you lose access to your own newsfeed, you lose access to posting on your own account, but you also lose access to posting on any other pages that you manage. For example, my friend has a separate page to manage his web design business. Um, or to promote his web design business, and he lost access to that for 30 days. He couldn't promote his business. You lose access to sending messages in Messenger, and a lot of people rely on Messenger for communication because Facebook keeps telling us to do so. You even lose your ability to log into some third-party apps that use Facebook for authentication. So this went on for a few months, with Facebook um, continually flagging their con content, increasing suspensions, and as an example, this is one image that got them in trouble. It's just a yellow box with Black Lives Matter, the words in it. That's all it is, black text on a yellow background and three words. The message they got on Facebook that you can see on the screen, it says, we removed the post below because it doesn't follow the Facebook community standards. So finally, later in 2016, the admins were notified that their page was permanently deleted. It says here, uh, the message they received, it says, your page has been unpublished and it cannot be published again. Learn more. They click learn more and Facebook was really specific. It's because they use this Black Lives Matter as their profile icon. That is why their page was deleted. If this sounds ridiculous to you, it, it really is. Similar things have happened to other left-leaning pages. Facebook provides a way to appeal, but every appeal they made, they got absolutely no response to it. All of their work of building a Facebook following over several years, it was just gone. The 27,000 followers don't even know this page was deleted unless they happen to notice there aren't posts coming from it anymore. They have no way to access these followers, to email them or anything like that. They're just, they're just gone. So I understand algorithms sometimes get it wrong. Facebook uh, human content moderators get it wrong sometimes too. They review thousands of posts every single day, some of them with very disturbing images in them. One content reviewer said they only get 10 seconds to review each post that comes through. So of course they make wrong decisions. The problem is there is no way to tell Facebook that they got it wrong. And sure you can appeal, but none of this uh, page's appeals for suspensions or deleted got a response, not any of them. So they don't even know if their appeals were even read. So first, oops, first of all, that's a horrible way to treat users. But when decisions like this appear to be based on political views, it brings up some serious ethical issues. We give social media companies so much power, but we need to remember, you know, there's people working there too. There's people that might be you or might be people like you. 
And if you're in a position like this, you have to be someone who's holding your employer accountable. This is a tweet from uh, Josh Mobley, who's a software engineer. He says, it's interesting to me that as a tech company, we'll vilify a Zuckerberg for what Facebook is, but not hold any of the mid-level engineers morally responsible for what they're contributing to. Instead, it's still portrayed as an honor to work there. So whatever you work on, you need to look at whether your company is acting ethically. And if they're not, try to change it. Don't just say, hey, it's not my responsibility. I just work here. I don't make the decisions. You have a decision as to what you do every day at your job. And if you feel that it's not right, you need to do something about that. And we talk all the time about Facebook sharing data uh, with third parties without our permission, or Twitter not being willing to ban actual Nazis that threaten people of color on their platform. And when we talk about these things, we do blame Mark Zuckerberg, we blame Jack Dorsey, but we don't talk about the thousands of software of engineers that make it possible for these things to happen. And it probably is someone just like you. So whatever you work on, you need to look at whether your company is acting ethically. If not, try to change it, but don't just assume it's not your responsibility. And here's another time that algorithm, algorithms on Facebook caused a problem. Here's a tweet from someone named Dustin Larimer. Uh, he says, I made a fun little bot that helps people manage their drinking. Last night I spoke with a few longtime users over Facebook Messenger about how it's helping them moderate or quit drinking. Today my Instagram feed is loaded with liquor company ads. Sadly, their feeds are probably full of booze ads too, and this is no accident. So basically, if you talk on Messenger about trying to stop drinking, Facebook takes that as a sign to encourage you to drink more. How might this affect someone who's an alcoholic? I mean, this is pretty horrible. So Dustin was able to stop these ads by going to his Facebook ad preferences and uh, unchecking the interest list items related to alcohol, which had just been added uh, to his profile. But most users don't even know that you can do that. Here's another worst case scenario. You see on the screen an article from The Verge that's titled, What Happens When an Algorithm Cuts Your Healthcare? So people with disabilities, uh, in many cases, they get help from state programs to, uh, for personal care items, like help with bathing or dressing or eating if they're not able to do those things themselves. So in, my remote is so weird today. So in uh, Arkansas, they have an assessor that per periodically interviews people with disabilities that get this help to determine how many hours a week of a caretaker they need. So at least it used to work that way. Now it's done by an algorithm. This is Tammy Dobbs, a woman who has cerebral palsy and needs help with most basic tasks. The woman you see in the picture, uh, she's sitting in a wheelchair in her own home. For years, she was allotted 56 hours a week of home health care worker, which is the maximum allowed, and it met her needs fairly well. In 2016, the assessor came and asked questions like usual, but instead of the assessor determining the level of care that Tammy needed, the assessor typed the responses into a computer. And then the computer spit out that Tammy's hours would be cut from 56 to 32 hours per week. So she was granted very upset because this wouldn't even cover all the basic tasks she needed, like meals or from transferring from her wheelchair to bed at night. She wanted to know why, but when she asked the assessor, this person didn't know. They didn't know. All they know is I type it into the computer and it gives me the answer. So that person couldn't help her at all. In Arkansas, like with other states with similar software, there's no explanation, no written standards to explain how these decisions are made. And more information about this didn't come out until a group of people filed a lawsuit. During the trial, the software company was asked by the court to calculate a score from one of the plaintiffs whose hours had been cut. So they went away, did the calculations, and came back and admitted that there had been a mistake in the algorithm and her hours should not have been cut after all. But this only came to light in court. And most patients, especially if they're already getting help from the state, they don't have money to spend on lawyers every time they're not getting what they need from the state program. So Tammy Dobbs found out her hours had been cut because cerebral palsy had been incorrectly coded in the algorithm. Another error cut hours for thousands of diabetes patients. The software is very complex, and even the president of the organization that designed it admits that it's not so simple. And he said, you're going to have to trust me that a bunch of smart people determine this is the smart way to do it. Well, even smart people make mistakes, and they did make mistakes, a lot of them. But if there's no transparency, how do you know if an algorithm is objective or fair? 
Did the people who built this really even take time to think about what the consequences would be for real humans if they made mistakes? Another thing to think about when you're uh, creating things is whether you're designing for everyone. From a business standpoint, uh, we usually design for the majority of users and leave out the edge cases, and that's fine, except when we're leaving out people who are already marginalized. One example is users with disabilities, and this is the idea of accessibility, which you've already heard about earlier today. So we need to make sure that websites and software we design can be used by everyone. And this means for people who are blind or visually impaired and use screen readers, we need to make uh, websites that can be used by screen readers and don't block them from getting information. Uh, if we have video on a site, it needs caption. Otherwise, people who are deaf or hard of hearing can't watch the videos. We need to make sure there aren't bl blinking things that can cause seizures because that can cause actual physical harm to users of our products. We need to make sure our language is simple and clear because people with learning disabilities, people who have a different first language, or people who are not privileged enough to get a good education can't use our website or software if they can't understand it. We need to make sure that what we build can load fast for people that, that don't have fast broadband. There's a lot of users still in remote areas where they just can't get high-speed internet. There are also a lot of users who still get dial-up at home because it's a lot cheaper than broadband. And again, until I read this recently, it didn't even occur to me that dial-up was still out there, but it is. It's something like 1% of users, which seems like not very many, but that translates into millions of people. Making software accessible is one part of being an ethical developer. If you're excluding edge cases, you also need to make sure you're not doing it because of race or gender. So on Facebook, when you uh, open an account, they ask for your real name, but they've made it clear that they don't understand the possible range of real names that people can have. For example, they've suspended Native American users because they say that a name like Lance Brown Eyes is not a real name. If you have a name like De La Cruz, you can't open an account because that has too many words in it. You can't have three words in your last name. People of Asian or Asian descent have had their names rejected because their name in their own language happens to be the same as the inappropriate word in English. Despite providing documents to show that that is their actual legal name, they're still not allowed to use their name to open an account. So if your team is more diverse, it's a lot easier to realize things like this are a problem. You know, if your team is diverse, you'll have a better understanding of the wide range of names that exist out there. Google, a couple years ago, added a feature to his photo app uh, where you could automatically, uh, it would automatically identify objects. So it did okay with skyscrapers and cars, but unfortunately, black people were labeled as gorillas in this app. So here's a tweet from someone named Jackie who says, Google Photos, y'all effed up. My friend is not a gorilla. And below that, there's several labeled photos, including two black people with a label of gorilla on the photo. This was not intentional by Google, I'm sure, but it, it happened. And by the way, only 1% of Google's technical staff is black, 1%. If they had a more diverse team, this is maybe something that they could have avoided. There's even more serious consequences not thinking about how software discriminates. In the US, the police use facial recognition software in various situations, such as to identify people they've encountered under undercover work uh, to later find an arrest. Facial recognition software is controversial because it's not always accurate. It sometimes identifies the wrong person. There's not really even a scientific consensus this, that this type of software is accurate, so it doesn't always hold up in court. But here's the thing. Not only is it not always accurate, but it's more likely to misidentify a black person than a white person. And so why is that? Uh, MIT Media Lab did some research and found the problem is that the algorithms for facial recognition software are usually written by white engineers. They're based on existing code libraries, also written by white engineers, and previous research in the field was based on white faces. And the software learns by looking at more photos. So if you're constantly putting in more white people photos, then that's what it gets used to and it gets better at. So MIT Media Labs tested three of the po uh, popular facial recognition systems and found that for all three of them, they accurately classified the gender for 99% of light-skinned males, 
but only 70% for dark-skinned females. So even famous women of color like Oprah, Serena Williams, and Michelle Obama were consistently labeled with the wrong gender by the software. So the problem that goes further with this is the people that use the software are not told that there's a bias in it. You know, like I mentioned before, people are like, oh, it's a computer. Computers are never biased. They're computers. But, but they're not unbiased. Computers are biased because the people that make the software are biased. So that brings us to the workplace. Uh, you don't have to have a diverse team to make software that's less biased or more ethical, but it's likely to help. So you should look around and see who's on your team. In general, they found that teams of people are better at solving any type of problem if the team is diverse. They've done studies on this. So that means diversity by race, by gender, by economic background. Silicon Valley hires a lot of people from universities like Stanford and Berkeley, where most of the students come from wealthy backgrounds. So basically, a bunch of rich white guys. And there's nothing wrong with rich white guys. You just don't want to have only rich white guys. You want to have all sorts of different people on your team. Hiring isn't part of web development, but some of you will be the boss at some point in your career, so you should be thinking about how you can create a more diverse team. If your company has not, done, uh, has not been diverse in their hiring in the past, they should look at who they're interviewing. If you're only interviewing white guys, there's a 100% chance you're only going to hire white guys, right? So there's some things you can do. There's something called the Rooney Rule in the National Football League. And this came about because in past decades, the league has not had many people of color in head coaching or senior roles. So in 2003, Dan Rooney, who was then the head of the league's diversity committee, implemented this rule. And this is Rooney you see on the screen. He's the tiny little white guy surrounded by a bunch of big football players that are like three times his size. Uh, so every time there's an opening for a top position, a team must interview at least one minority candidate. And this is not affirmative action because they're not required to hire a minority. Um, they only have to interview one, and this ensures the team is fairly considering minority applicants. And to see if this works, you just need to look at the first three years after the rule was in place. The number of black head coaches went from 6% to 22%. And as an aside, almost 70% of the players are black, so why shouldn't their bosses be black, right? Uh, they have a similar rule that's been implemented in other sports and even at tech companies like Pinterest, Amazon, and Facebook. So this is something that your company can do. Just make sure when you're interviewing for a position that you're finding at least one person of color, or at least one person, to, uh, at least one woman to interview for the position. And you don't have to hire them, but you're gonna find great candidates that you wouldn't have otherwise considered. The next problem is what if people of color and women are not applying to your jobs? You can't just blame them for not applying. You have to find out why they're not applying and fix it. Might be, might be because you're not posting on the right job boards. It might be because you're rel relying on word of mouth when your current network of employees is not diverse to start out with. So you should look online for better ways to reach women and people of color, but also think about your job descriptions as a starter. I still see gendered language all the time, like describing an ideal candidate and using he and him as the pronouns. I saw an ad recently for a developer job that started with dear guys. So that clearly is not something where a woman is going to feel welcome there. Here's a post that Corey Foy made on Twitter recently. He said, friends, do you know of a great female engineering IT leader looking for a CTO role, remote company doing some really cool work? People got so mad in response to this. They're claiming it's reverse discrimination, he's violating the law, but it's not illegal because he's not saying they're only going to hire females. He's just look, asking for recommendations to make sure that they're considering female candidates. So he responded to all, all this negative negativity that he got, and he said this. He said, we give subtle and overt cues to women and minority candidates all the time that they aren't welcome. If you want to broaden the pool of people, sometimes you have to let them know you understand that history. Which is true, because if someone had posted, do you know of a great guy looking for a CTO role? Most people would not have even noticed that there's something wrong with that. You also need to make sure your workplace feels welcoming to women, people of color, people who are transgender, people with disabilities, people from other countries. One example I can think of, a, a local web agency where I live, and there's probably a lot of these elsewhere too, they brag about all the beer kegs they have in their office. Who does that keep from applying? 
Perhaps it's women who feel vulnerable to sexual assault by men who are drunk all the time. How about recovering alcoholics? How about people who are just afraid they won't fit in with drinking culture? It might seem like a workplace benefit, but it's also a workplace turnoff for a lot of people. So think about, is your workplace welcoming? So to finish up, I want to talk about government a little bit. You already know that immigration is a really big issue uh, right now. Here you see the border wall in El Paso. The US government use so uses software databases to decide which foreigners to allow into the United States, and uh, it also helps them identify and track people that they want to deport. So recently, ICE was looking for new software to track many sources of data about immigrants, such as social media. They want to find who is a positively contributing member of society. The problem a lot of people see with this is if you're pulling in too much data, you can find a reason to deport anybody. If you are an immigrant and you happen to post a photo on Facebook of you drinking a beer, does that mean that you're not a positively contributing member of society? I think the government might try to take it that way if they felt like it. This reminds me a little bit of what happened in 1943. The U.S. Census Bureau gathered up data on uh, people of Japanese ancestry and provided that to um, the government agencies at the time that were sending Japanese people to internment camps. The Census Bureau actually spent decades denying that this even happened and only recently uh, were people able to find evidence that yes, it did happen. Also during World War II, IBM and some of its subsidiaries created innovations for Nazi Germany to help them identify Jews, to trace families, to organize their concentration camps. So were the employees of IBM in the US okay with this? Um, they were possibly not aware of what they were working on. At the time, newspapers were not really sharing the full extent of what was happening in, in Europe. But now we have the internet, so you have no excuse for not knowing what your work is doing and who it might be hurting. Uh, Ada Rose Cannon responded on Twitter when she heard that ICE had invited tech companies to develop algorithms that will track visa holders' social media activities. She says, as a developer, if you are ever asked to do something like this, pause and look at yourself and what you are enabling. Someone else would do it, so I might as well get paid for it, is not an excuse. Don't build evil, don't enable evil systems. We need a tech Hippocratic Oath. Microsoft has been getting a lot of backlash for their work with ICE. In January, Microsoft boasted on their website that they're helping ICE process data on edge devices or utilize deep learning capabilities to accelerate facial recognition and identification. So basically using facial recognition to track undocumented immigrants. By summer, Microsoft employees had called on Microsoft to cancel this $20 million contract with ICE. 100 plus employees signed an open letter and they said, as the people who build the technologies that Microsoft profits from, we refuse to be complicit. The CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, told workers uh, that they only contract with ICE for mail, calendar, and document management. So then why were they bragging about helping ICE using facial recognition, right? Microsoft did not end its contract with ICE. Google had a deal with the Defense Department to provide artificial intelligence to help mili the military analyze drone video. Military drones can be used to kill people. Um, so in response to numerous employee resignations, Google announced they were setting new ethical guidelines for their company. They would uh, ban development of any AI software that could be used in weapons, break international law, or harm or surveil people in a violation of internationally accepted norms of human rights. So speaking up can make a difference. This past February, Jordan Deardall Roberts quit as a legal secretary at the Montana Department of Labor. He was asked to process ICE subpoenas that would give ICE wage reports for undocumented immigrants, uh, which would help lead to their de deportation. His manager offered to give him alternate tasks, but he knew that they would still process the subpoenas. He didn't want to be part of an agency that helps ICE. You don't collaborate with fascists, he said to the Huffington Post. So he wrote on Twitter the day he quit. He said, I work at the Montana Department of Labor. There were going to be ICE subpoenas for information that would end up being used to hunt down and deport undocumented workers. It would have been my responsibility to prepare the information to hand them over to ICE. I refuse to aid in the breaking up of families. I refuse to just follow orders. 
This is another person who didn't just follow orders. Uh, this picture is of René Carmi, who is often called the first hacker. He was the Comptroller General of the French Army in the 1930s, and then he headed up the French census after that. So then the Nazis came. They occupied France, and they wanted to use the census to find out who was Jewish. So Carmi kept doing his job, but he also found ways to hinder the Nazis. He used census data to find recruits for the French resistance. He physically hacked punch card machines so that nothing could be entered in the religion column, which meant that this religion data was missing for thousands of people. He and his team were eventually caught uh, and killed, a fate they probably expected. But let me tell you what happened. Next door in the Netherlands, 73% of Jews were found and executed. But in France, where Carmi hacked the punch cards, only 25% of Jews were found. The Nazis just couldn't find them without this data. So many, many thousands of lives were saved because he hacked the data. I really hope that none of you are in a similar position ever in your lifetime. But there will be other things asked of you that will, that will feel ethically wrong. And you need to pay attention and understand what you're working on and how it actually affects people. And don't just follow orders. Thank you.